What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Lockdown 23 and 1. And today, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be hitting up the Street Story playlist. That's right, I got a couple street stories coming your way about the Hells Angels, my run in with the Hells Angels. One was actually very shocking to me, and the second one was definitely uh, a scary moment in my life. <laughs> to say the least, man. You know, we haven't done no street stories in a while, but I read an article the other day and it just brought back some memories of my run-in with these individuals, okay? I was reading an article about uh, Hell's Angel president in Rhode Island, you know, charged with some pretty serious crimes, and he was petitioning to get a new judge because the judge... Uh, her husband worked on a task force that raided the clubhouse in 2019, some crazy shit, uh, but was denied. He even went all the way up to Supreme Court, I believe, and was denied there as well. So he's going to be going in front of the judge that he didn't want to go in front of for these serious charges. And I always wondered to myself, man, when they petition to get new judges and they don't, I wonder if that judge holds any kind of animosity. Like, I'm definitely going to smoke your boots now. You try to get me up out of here. Nah, not today. I'm here to send you to the pen, my friend. You know, that's that's always what I be thinking when people try to fight the system in that kind of way. You know, remove a prosecutor, remove a judge, and they don't. You know, I wonder if those guys take it personally. But that's not the story that I'm bringing your way today, even though that's the bulk of it, if y'all want to go look that up. It just brought back memories that I think y'all might laugh at. You know, a lot of people, they can laugh at my pain. <laughs> Now, before we get into that, please do not forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell before you leave. We talk about all things prison and crime related, from street stories to interviews with individuals that have done a lot of time in prison. Or just a little bit of time, but they had a good learning experience. But the interview thing, ladies and gentlemen, let me speak on this for one second. I did an interview on someone yesterday, had some pretty serious allegations put against him, and he was sentenced to death at the age of 16, and now he's free, you know? By however means or process it went through, there's a lot of different things that went into this case. I've read the whole case file and case hearings, and I'm just going to say this. I have decided to leave that interview off of my channel. There's too many what-ifs, you know, too many what-ifs, and a lot of my viewers brought some valid points my way. You know, I appreciate that. There's a lot of people out there that uh, watch these interviews, you know. Anyone that decides to come onto this channel and do their, I don't do a lot of detective work. Y'all know that. Y'all know I do not do that. You know, I don't check the paperwork for the most part, but this one I probably should have checked a little bit more. So to make a long story short, uh, in an interview yesterday, he said that the confession that the officer gave to whoever to prosecute him was completely made up, and he just signed a piece of paper set thinking that he was going to be released uh, after a polygraph test, you know, kind of set up. So it's kind of like his word versus the state's word, paperwork, you know. What am I supposed to do? Okay, yeah, dude was found guilty for these charges, or whatever the case is. But at the same time, he's saying that they were all made up. But I'm not sitting here saying that that shit don't happen. You know, there, there's made up confessions all the time and coerced into signing things all the time. But who am I to figure that shit out? I'm just a YouTuber trying to bring interesting stories y'all's way. You know, so uh, just remember that anybody that comes onto this channel for interviews, man. There's people out there that's going to do a full background check on your ass. <laughs> full! But anyways, back to the topic at hand. Two stories of me running into the Hell's Angels on the streets. <laughs> the first one was pretty damn wild. You know, I wasn't really scared about the situation, but, you know, I was like, what the hell are these fools doing here? Look, first things first, man. Hey, I got to say this. Biker gangs, you know, for the most part, uh, like the official ones, Hey, they're pretty badass, man. You know what I mean? The vests, patches, all that shit, especially if they're, you know, they're world-renowned micro gangs. If you run into them, everyone's always staring at them. You know, you get someone with a motorcycle uh, in front of you on the road at a stoplight, and he's got a Hell's Angel vest, I guarantee everyone around him is going to be staring at him. It's a Hell's Angel, dog. You know, they're almost like superstars. <laughs> You know, biker gangs in general, or, you know, just a group of bikers, if they roll up on you, it could be very intimidating to the square, to the average square, you know? But I've been to a lot of bars, a lot of biker bars. I used to drink with a lot of bikers and see these individuals come in and out, you know? So it's not really anything new to me and not too much 
of it strikes fear in my heart. It kind of, if anything, it's it's just cool to see them come in and, and, and the way they act and shit like that. Especially Hell's Angels, man, because every time I've seen them come in a bar with a group of individuals, they're always so professional, man. You know, melancholy, I guess you could say. I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, they never got wild or anything. You know, they're just very, very professional. But anyways, first story, first story, first run-in. Well, this ain't my first run-in with the Hell's Angel. First run-in I ever had with the Hell's Angel was in prison. I tattooed him, and I messed up the tattoo, and he he freaking rocked the brick wall. I said, oh, shit. <laughs> hey, you know it's bad when, uh, you know, even though me and him were pretty close in there, you know it's bad when you're in prison and you're tattooing a Hell's Angel, you know. And this, I don't even know if I was allowed to be doing it, but I was actually doing a Hell's Angel tattoo on him. You know, some gangs, they don't allow you to get gang tattoos unless it's by another gang member. I don't know if that's the case with this one, but it is what it is. You know, a lot of people bend the rules for that shit. I've seen official gang members go to the damn tattoo shop, don't know nothing about the artist, and, and get some gang shit done by them, you know? So, I guess it's really up to the individual. But anyways, I was doing it, and I screwed up. Screwed up pretty damn bad. And uh, he rocked the damn wall in prison. Fuck! Nailed the wall in prison. That's all, oh, man. Here we go. We're about to get it in. You know, but it turned out to be all right. I fixed it, touched it up a little bit. I'm sure it looks like trash now. <laughs> I can almost guarantee it does. But anyways, that was my first run in with an Hell's Angel. And it was in prison. You know, like I said, I've seen many of them throughout time. But this was another personal encounter with the Hell's Angel. Very... Uh, what's the word? I was very shocked, I guess you could say, when this happened. It was more of along the lines of I didn't know what the hell was going on, right? So anyways, I'm driving down the interstate. I was in my old affinity, right? I was driving down the interstate uh, near this city called Chesapeake, Indian River area. I just so happened to be going down there, I think, to pick up Grizzly or something. Anytime I go back to Indian River, my old neighborhoods, it's because Grizzly's out there, you know? So I went over there, and I got a flat tire on the interstate. I called Grizzly. I said, hey, man, you need to come over here and help me with this flat tire. He's like, I can't. He said, my old lady's got the car. I can't come out there. So I knew a few people from back in the day that I still, uh, you know, talk to here and there, but not really that much. So I don't know too much about them, but I do know they work on cars. <laughs> One of these guys, man, he, he does a paint thing. And then another guy, he does, works on all kinds of car parts and stuff. And ever since they were young, they've done this type of stuff. So I hit him up and I said, hey man, you in the area? He's like, yeah man, I'm in the area. I said, hey, I need you to come help me with my freaking tire, man. <laughs> you know, I don't know nothing about cars. I mean, I have a basic idea on how to change a flat tire. Yes, I've done that before. I've changed some brakes. But the thing here is, I didn't have the tool to take off the tire. And I didn't know what to do. You know, I had the key for the rim, but I didn't have a lug wrench. I don't know why there wasn't no lug wrench in the car. Maybe there was, I just didn't find it. Whatever the case was, I called my homeboy up from the past and I told him the situation. I said, man, I'm not too far from so-and-so. I knew he still lived in the area. He bought a house over there not too long ago. I went over there to do some things at one point. Uh, but this guy was always a nice dude. You know, you, you wouldn't think anything of it. He's just nice. He wasn't never a part of the shenanigans me and Grizzy got a part of. And he was just a good guy. A good guy family guy, man, for the most part. So I call him up and I tell him where I'm at. And he said, all right, I'll be there shortly, man. I was like, damn right. I appreciate you, man. For real. I really do appreciate you. So I'm sitting there in my car on the side of the interstate. And all of a sudden I see all these motorcycles pull up about six or seven of them. Maybe not that many. Maybe it was about four or five, but there was two that pulled up behind the car and two, two or three that pulled up in the front and they get off their bikes. I get out of my car almost immediately. I get out of my car almost immediately because I don't want them surrounding me. I don't know who these freaking bikers are or what they wanted. You know, I was getting a little paranoid. But, you know, when I get paranoid like that, all fear goes out and it's just survival mode. You know what I mean? So I'm thinking, you know, I don't know what to think. I don't know what to think. I'm thinking maybe they just want to help me. <laughs> maybe this biker gang or whatever, whoever it is, just wants to help me. So they get closer and I realize it's Hell's Angels. It's Hell's Angels, and now I'm thinking really crazy, you know? And then I see my homeboy. I said, man, what the, I said, what the hell are you doing rolling up on me like this, man? Look, 
It was crazy. He said, I knew you were going to get scared of shit when we rolled up, bro. I said, oh, man. I said, when the hell did this happen? You know? He wasn't, I'd never seen him on a motorcycle in my life. And, and then uh, he's got the damn Hell's Angel vest. I'm like, yo, turn around. Let me see that shit. That shit's bad. How did I get me one of them? <laughs> hey, they're all laughing their ass off, except for one guy. One guy was staring at me like he still, like he wanted to kill me for some reason. You know, I, I'm always one of those guys that will make you laugh in a group setting. You know, especially in an awkward one where you feel like, hey, maybe these guys might be your enemy. I'll, I'll crack a joke in some kind of way, shape, or form, and they'll all start laughing. But it's always bad when one guy don't laugh and he's looking at you serious still. That's that one guy. You know he don't like your ass. You know, and I was like, oh, shit. I was laughing. I said, <laughs> <laughs> I said, all right, you ain't the one to mess with, all right? You ain't the one to mess with, but long story short, you know, he helped me change my tire, and those guys turned out to be pretty cool cats, and uh, it was just very, he, he caught me off guard. That's the word I was looking for earlier. He caught me off guard, rolling up deep like that, and I ain't gonna lie, man. I kind of felt like a boss, <laughs> but shout out to you, man, for helping me out. You know, I don't know if he watches my content, but uh, he owns a lot of automotive businesses now, so he's a pretty busy guy. But he looked out for the cookout, man. You know, and I ain't seen him in a while, and it meant a lot to me. Uh, second, this one ain't so cool. This one ain't so cool at all. I was at a bar. It was definitely a biker bar. Uh, I can't remember her name. It might have been Route something. I don't know, man, but I went there alone. I went... I used to go to bars alone, believe it or not, until uh, I came into some situations where some of my enemies were outside waiting to jump me, put put a gun to my face and all this other shit. Uh, that's when I started never to go to bar alone, you know, or club. This occasion, I was young. I was still going through some shit, uh, fresh out of prison the first time, fresh out of prison the first time. And I went to a biker bar, you know, I was, I was drinking like clockwork because I was trying to quit bud. So I was in this bar and I remember I was eating wings. I was eating wings and then the bartender came up to me and uh, asked me if I wanted some moonshine. I said, nah, I said, nah, I'm good. Just keep giving me my Coors Light, Jack Daniels. You know, I used to drink a, every time I sat at the bar, I'd get two shots of Jack Daniel. And I, I would drink Coors Light. Yes, I know a lot of y'all probably say it's a sissy beer. I love Coors Light. The mountain, the mountains are blue, boy. Cold as the Rockies. <laughs> I don't know. I just always like Coors Light. God, I can already see the comment section. Man, drink like a real man. Why well, had some Jack Daniels drinking that? You know. But I would get two shots and I would drink those first, and then I would just marinate at the bar drinking beers. You know. So. This night, like I said, the bartender, uh, I was eating wings, and I was about done, and the bartender offered me some moonshine. And I tasted a sip of it. It was pretty good. I was already pretty damn wasted uh, by myself. And I was, you know, you know you're know, you wasted when you're, you're having conversation with strangers, and y'all are like just best friends, man. It's like, <laughs> I don't know you, dude. Should I ask for your number before I leave, man? I feel like we were just connecting on a different level, man, you know? Uh, but there's this one guy that came in, and uh, he got real close to me at the bar, man. He's rubbing up on me, and he didn't say excuse me or nothing, man. This fucking punk, this little punk just keeps rubbing up on me. So finally, you know, I say something. I say something probably a little rude, you know, because to be completely honest, if you judge a book by its cover, this guy looked like a punk. Soft served. Soft served dairy ice cream. So uh, I'm like, yeah, give me some space, man. You don't even say excuse me. Or I don't know. I don't remember what I said to him, but I came off a little hostile. One thing led to another, and we get to argue. It turns into like a full combative ass argument. I'm out of the bar stool. I'm ready to fight this guy. And he gets on the phone, and he says, I got something for you. And he walks out. I'm like, what's this dude going to do? So anyways, I'm going out there smoking a cigarette. And the guy's on my mind a little bit, you know, still thinking about what he might have in store for me, you know, even though I didn't think it was anything. Uh, long story short, some bikers came up. A group of bikers rolled up, and dude was parked right in front of the bar in a black truck, like an F-150 tinted out, and he gets out the car, and, and he's walking in front of all these bikers. Turns out these bikers are Hell's Angels. I'm like, oh shit. 
I just mess with the wrong square, man. You know, I flip my cigarette bud. I go into the bar. The bar has tinted windows in the front door, so you can't really see nothing. I went in there all calmly, you know, calmly as soon as the bar door is closed. Foo! Went straight past all the employees. My staff, an open tab, but I go to this bar on a regular basis, so they know. And I, I've never seen the guy before, but they know me. Uh, they probably know him. I don't know, but i never seen him. I go there almost every freaking night, you know, because it's close to my house. And they got cheap beers and wings, you know. So these people know me, and they see me fly in the back, out the back door. And I go in a neighborhood. I go in a neighborhood, and I just take a long walk. Long walk. And so finally, man, I felt like it would die down enough for me to slide back to my car. That was a very scary moment, and... I called the bar. I called the bar after I got my car and left, and I told him, I said, hey, look, them dudes are trying to kill me. I'll come back and pay that tab later on. <laughs> hey, you got to know when to hold them and when to fold them, dog. Yeah, and be careful. Be careful, ladies and gentlemen. You don't know who the hell them little weak-looking dudes might know.